Good evening to everybody. Um, I have to say that I'm, I'm going to try to, to be concrete, but it's a very difficult task to do after this powerful evening that we just have to, to share with all these powerful presentations and all these powerful women, I have to say. No, I feel that everything I, I feel honored to be with all these amazing women. Of course, my colleagues have also <laughs> an important side of my heart. You know Joshua. But um, it's, always, it's always so exciting to see how women are, are changing the world and building, building um, the spaces of hope, no? which is so important and so powerful. And I would like to start saying thank you to the ECCHR for the invitation and uh, congratulate uh, them for this very interesting uh, discussion that we, we had today and to think collectively on the colonial repercussions, which is uh, the approach that I would like to invite you all to have, particularly for countries in the Global South as Namibia and I also salute Mr. De Sousa and Mr. Kruger. And I have to say that uh, I know the topic of the genocide of the Obajerero and Nama in Namibia is a topic of great significance and that must be treated with great respect. For that reason, and to be clear, I will not, not speak directly on that issue because everybody already did it in an amazing way. Since there were some very interesting lectures throughout this day on Namibia and my scope of work doesn't focus specifically in the African continent and doesn't focus in Namibia, but rather I would like to react to the ECCHR publication and colonial, on colonial repercussions. And if anything learned from the experience in Namibia can be thought, of course, in other countries in the Global South and more than ever in, the, in a particular way in our countries in Latin America. My name is Alejandra Ancheita. I am the founder and executive director of the Project of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, PRODESC, uh, which is a Mexican organization of human rights that have already 14 years in the defense of economic, social and cultural rights of indigenous communities and also agrarian communities. And at the same time, we are also working in the defense of uh, labor rights. Um, but I would like to connect the, the reflection that we had during the afternoon in a very specific, a specific way to our work in the defense to the right to land, territory, and natural resources of indigenous communities. Um, the rights of indigenous communities in the Global South have been violated for a very long time. And reading the, the publication that we were also celebrating from the European Center, I couldn't stop thinking about the conditions in my own country, Mexico, where a large part of the indigenous population was killed during the Spanish conquest for diseases, for systematic, systematically raped of women, and for having to do forced work. And those who remained were forced to assimilate a culture and a, re a religion they didn't know and they didn't relate. During the Spanish rule, the issue of whether indigenous people had to be conquered came out. Spain argued that indigenous people were committing terrible sins and that its duty was to educate them in the right way. That is 
depriving them of their cultural heritage, their memory, and forcibly stalling their own culture. Independent Mexican, Mexico wasn't able to tackle the issues of indigenous population either. A liberal project ruled Mexico through most of the 19th, 19th century and indigenous population found it difficult to have. The new Mexican state recognized the rights to the land they, that they have to inhabit it for centuries. The Mexican Revolution from 1910, 1910 to 1917 had the participation of indigenous and agrarian communities fighting for their land and their territories. And a revol revolutionary as Emiliano Zapata where point, was pointing out that the land is owned by the ones who work it, trying to break the monopoly of the land in Mexico and benefited, that, that was benefited a small group of people. Even though the indigenous communities in Mexico continued their, their defense of land, territory, and natural resources, the topic was presented to a worldwide audience, audience after the Zapatista movement in 1994. This movement gave the Mexican government a clear message. The signing of NAFTA, which was the, um, the economic agreement between Mexico, Canada, and the United States, and the paths for Mexico to modernize will mean the destruction of indigenous communities and indigenous communities have had enough. What we can learn about the case of Namibia in relation to Mexico. ECCHR publication is very clear, both the German state and some corporations benefit from the colonization. This may seem obvious now, but a few years ago, the discussion regarding business and human rights, regarding corporate accountability, was almost non-existent. And the ECCHR and other organizations in the Global South has play, had played a key, a key role in putting these issues into the public arena. Corporations have to be held accountable for the human rights violation, violations they commit when they take out resources or they dispossess a community of their land. Their businesses are so very profitable only because they don't care about human rights. In the 20th century land, in the 20th century land and territory are more than ever important. Land and territory are what the corporations need to sustain this model of development based on their overexploitation of natural resources and people in the global south. Through, dispos through dispossession and forced displacement of entire communities, including genocide. It is also mentioned that the impacts of colonization are still felt by the grandsons and granddaughters of those who were killed in the genocide, particularly economic, social, and cultural rights. In the context of Mexico, indigenous people still face discrimination, inequality, are less likely to attend higher education and good paying jobs and are forced to leave their territories to the cities in search of a better life. Millions of them had to leave Mexico, altogether migrating to the United States. Indigenous human rights defenders in Mexico are particularly subject to threat, violence, and murder. If in Namibia, independence didn't bring social justice, it is fair to say that in Mexico, a real democracy system hasn't brought social just, justice either. The genocide in Namibia happened 
115 years ago looks like a long, long time for the families of the victims and for the whole country. Mexico, on the other hand, has been dealing with similar topics about the rights of indigenous populations, reparation and retribution after 500 years of the fall of our civilization. And after 200 years of our independence, just as an example, the current government of Andres Manuel López Obrador sent a letter a few months ago to the Spanish king and to the Vatican demanding they apologize for the atrocities committed in the conquest. Indigenous communities remain, they are here with us, they are an influential part of our culture, of our language, of our memory, our history, of our richness as a country, and they have the right of equality and of achieve justice. The challenge is to fold. How to achieve justice for communities for injustices that they, that they have suffered, but also how to break the cycle of poverty, inequality and exclusion now to avoid its repetition in the future. This will only be achieved building collective power. Justice must involve the communities themselves not just as an empty concept, concept, but with particular measures. Are we demanding economic compensation, a redistribution of the land, a constitutional amendment? That can only be decided by the communities themselves. We, as lawyers, as politicians, must understand that we are not the saviors, but just as a, a small part of a strategy that the community has decided to defend their rights and to exercise the right of self-determination establishing in the international law of human rights. In my opinion, social justice will only be achieved by demanding, if not only in the country, where the communities live, but also in the countries where the corporations that benefited from human rights violations are located. That it most of the times in the global north as Germany. The struggle for social justice is one step by step with small actions that lead to the systemic change we are seeking as lawyers, it is important to stress that this issue is not about writing a bill or voting a law. It is a matter of an imbalance of power. If we continue this path, there is a real danger that communities will not be able to reproduce in their territories and their culture. The loss, the loss of a culture has brought negative impact, not just for that community, but for the humankind. I would like to also acknowledge all my fellows in the previous presentations. I would like to acknowledge Joshua and the remark that he brought about the law as a tool of emancipation. Also Sima about how history from communities matters and how the whole point of all the struggles is dignity. It is not money, it is dignity. I would like to acknowledge John for the reflection related to passions. We need to build the changes that we wanted to see with passions, with kindness. With, with, we have to be bold, but we have to be also strategic. I would like to, to acknowledge Aida 
for your clarity. You know very well what your people need and what your people want. And your leadership is a very powerful and clear leadership and we need your leadership in Namibia and also in the world. To Alexandra for the very complex analysis related to the comparison of law. And of course to Isabel and Trixie because they, they are telling us how to reclaim our bodies as women as our territory and how reclaiming our bodies can also be part of the freedom of our territories as a community. I would like to say that it's better to have these conversations now, even if look like it's late, but it's better than ever. The challenges ahead remain, but building collective power and holding the state and corporations accountable is a step forward to achieve justice. Building another history is possible and building spaces of hope is part of really, really changing the future for a future that we can enjoy collectively and in freedom. Thank you so much. I would like, uh, first of all, to thank this, uh, the invitation to be here uh, to Wolfgang. And uh, it was uh, a, a wonderful day for me. I learned very much and I was uh, very moved also. It was uh, an enchanting seminar. I would like to contribute a little bit with, uh, uh, yeah, with an issue uh, that could perhaps possibly link uh, the colonial history to our, our days. Uh, and I think that uh, the role of ideas is, uh, is very important because uh, we are not bees. Uh, bees uh, has uh, a DNA to inform uh, their, their actual behavior and our and uh, since we are human beings, we need ideas. Those ideas can be frozen, and we do not have conscious that we are, uh, we are obeying ideas in our behavior, but there's always ideas. And, uh, and I think that uh, it's very important to, uh, to see uh, which ideas are uh, presupposed in any form of modern uh, domination, and I think that these ideas are uh, re related to things like Joshua said, uh, subject object, and also uh, we could also see that as property and democracy, in a way, it's, uh, it's the same imbalance. And I uh, could see, and, and I think also that uh, when we separate spirit and body, we are talking about the moral grammar of every oppression. Every oppression in modern times uh, can be uh, not uh, reduced, but uh, f f has the focus of the separation of the spirit and body. I mean, uh, uh, women are perceived as body and men uh, 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 are perceived as uh, spirit, although this is, uh, um, yeah, this is foolish, of course. <laughs> Blacks are perceived as body, and white people are perceived as spirit. Uh, workers are perceived as body, and the ruling classes are always perceived as spirit. And uh, this is very important because we cannot oppose global north and global south, although I can understand it very well. 
because uh, here in Germany and also in France, for instance, when uh, the Gilets jaunes are in the streets by millions, they are suffering the same way as uh, Chilean people in Chile, and for the same reasons also. And I think that is, uh, that is very important that we have this fact in mind because uh, when we, uh, the, whole, the, whole idea, the, the whole science that uh, we think that uh, uh, we all, also we intellectuals think that uh, ideas uh, are in the books of a library. No, no, it, that, that, that is very wrong. Uh, books and ideas are everywhere because the ideas of the intellectuals are in the papers. Uh, no journalist creates the ideas they use. Uh, ideas are in the politics. Ideas are in the schools. Ideas are in the universities, uh, forming all the elites in all, all dimensions of life. And uh, the ideas of the separation of uh, uh, spirit and the, the body uh, uh, were also in the foundation of uh, the colonialism of Europeans in the 19th century, but are also in the ideas of American informal imperialism of the 20 and 21st century. Uh, what this was made was just a, just a just a, re, a refinement, a more subtle idea that you, you, you say even that you are not racist anymore because you are not talking about races. You are not talking about whites and blacks. You are talking about Protestant, and for, uh, especially ascetic Protestantism, huh? as, a, as the culture, uh, the superior culture, and, this, uh, uh, and, uh, and then you have the rest. Uh, so, so you can inferiorize using science as it was used uh, in the religion in the past uh, to uh, legitimate all kinds uh, of oppression. And we, we have now uh, uh, the same thing going on. It is not the USA, of course, it's the elite of the USA because the, 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 uh, 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 its own people is being oppressed and uh, and uh, and this oppressed also using using arguments that uh, would be very in line with this uh, separation of spirit and body i mean uh, the own people is considered as dumb as foolish uh, that is that is not my words the, those are the words of the fabric of consentment that was built in America uh, since the First World War to manipulate their own people huh? and, uh, and, to, and to guide them by an elite of the intellectual privileged uh, property uh, so social class. And it's very important also for Latin American and other uh, regions that are uh, oppressed is the, uh, the word of corruption, because corruption is a word to oppress and legitimate oppression. Huh? It, is, uh, it, is very, it is very, very important for Africa, it's very important for Latin America, because it legitimizes that, that you get the richness uh, the enterprises as is uh, going on in Brazil right now, for, for instance, you simply take the most important enterprises huh, for nothing and you say that's because Brazilians are uh, from, from history a corrupt nation of corrupted people and you must have, you must give uh, all the richness and all the uh, state enterprises to the Americans because they are decent. It's not me, it's the public discourse. They, uh, those, these things are written in the papers. Now, of course, they were for centuries, centuries, now, said in, in the 
in every uni uh, university all around the, the world. Huh? Uh, political science was made out of those, of those ideas. Also, law, law was taught in, uh, according to those lines. And so you have a naturalized world that is racist. We all are racist. We, we have to criticize ourselves in the f first place. Huh? Uh, and uh, one of those things that make me, that make me uh, very, uh, that I admire very much in Germany, where I live, uh, a great part of my life is exactly uh, the tradition of criticizing uh, themselves uh, in the in the history and the tradition of fascism, I think there is a uh, there is a there's a learning process that is uh, very important to uh, have and have as an example. I think that uh, we have also uh, uh, the challenge today to empower people, to empower people, empower poor people, where we have. Uh, we have uh, a press that is bought by financial capital everywhere, legitimizing, which is also just a leg legitimization of, uh, of property. And we have many communities uh, who are not only poor, but have no access for uh, any other kind of interpretation of what's going on with their lives. I think that is a, it is a time uh, that we should uh, not fragment our, our, our struggle, but unite them because they are very, uh, because they are, they are uh, in, in their very uh, uh, specific manner, uh, uh, the fight of the women, the fight of the workers, the fight of the uh, people who have no, no rights, all those fighters uh, come from a very, very similar standpoint of ideas, which are, which are uh, the ideas uh, who, uh, which are behind the forces that we are uh, facing. Uh, right, right now with the financialization and everything, things that are uh, uh, very difficult to grasp, also for uh, people with much education, uh, not said for people who, uh, who doesn't have uh, that kind of uh, weapon. Uh, I think that is, uh, uh, here today we had uh, uh, very beautiful examples how how this can be can can be done, and I hope that this uh, can be made also uh, for the future. I would thank you very much. Dear participants, Excellency, dear Wolfgang, dear Johannes. By ignoring the past, we are encouraged to repeat its mistakes. Audrey Lord wrote in her groundbreaking essay, Age, Race, Class and Sex, Women Redefining Difference. Germany's colonial past was ignored for far too long by those in power. But we are now seeing the beginnings of a critical analysis of the colonial era, thanks to the adoption of anti-colonial struggles and of post-colonial approaches. Yet there is still a long way to go and we in the civic education segment must also do our part to reappraise this chapter of Germany's history. The social climate in Germany is currently one of divisive, uh, divisiveness and there are those who actively negate the country's identity as a place of immigration and pervert that identity to their own ends. Against this backdrop, analyzing Germany's colonial crimes is not only a duty but also offers opportunities both for our present and our future. 
Colonialism is more than a system of political order and should thus not be considered a fact we can consign to the past. Instead, it is important to explore how it manifested itself culturally and what strategies and narratives were established as a result of colonial rule and continue to have an effect today. The Peruvian sociologist Anibal Quijano summarized these ideas in his coloniality of power concept at the beginning of the 1990s. He showed that coloniality provides the structure in which we coexist in today's capitalist and global form of rule. Power structures do not develop or exist in a vacuum. They are part of the result of practices that have continued for centuries in some cases. Othering processes in which marginalized groups are seen as the others and excluded can be traced back directly to colonial rule. The era of colonialism is also synonymous with the establishment of a dichotomous system of representation full, full uh, by stereotypes and a tendency for one side to see itself as superior to the other. The debates being conducted today are testimony to the fact that this type of system still has an effect all too often they show that representations of difference aim to demonstrate the rejection of the notions of belonging or connection. When discussing migration issues, it is constantly necessary to draw attention to stereotypes and the diminished estimation that accompanies them as well as to actively confront them. The political scientist Kinni Ha speaks of colonial effects on the racist conditions in present-day society. Analyses of Germany's colonial past are thus not only necessary in order to render past crimes visible, but also to effectively tackle present-day discriminatory practices and to create awareness of power mechanisms that reproduce exclusion. However, the reappraisal process themselves require this awareness to, if they are not to engender discriminatory pro procedures, Eurocentric standards and racist effects. This is also true of how we consider Germany's genocide of Herero and Nama today and cannot be seen as distinct from the controversial issue on appropriate remembrance and reparations policy. The Federal Agency for, uh, Federal Agency for Civic Education itself as an in, uh, educational institution that imparts knowledge, thereby creating certainties, is also a part of the decades old hegemonic knowledge cultures and products. In the field of education in particular, as one of the key places of interpretative study, we need to consider the question of cognitive and epistemic justice. What is considered knowledge? Why and where? Who has access to which knowledge? What perspectives are perceived and what narratives related how and when? If we ask ourselves precisely these questions and do so with sincerity, we will recognize the ignorance apparent in the blind spots in knowledge production. Social diversity and continuing colonial and global inequalities must be reflected in our institutions at more than just the formal level. People and the different knowledge and perspective they bring with them must be given an equal say and an equal opportunity to be heard. And there have to be conscious confrontations, especially with less palatable issues, from everyday racism, which might not be a scene for what it is, to scrutinization uh, of current political and juridical practices. To be truly critical, different viewpoints are crucial. 
One needs to, uh, on, only to think uh, of James Baldwin's assertion that uh, actions of violence committed by Europeans came as no surprise of the African-American population. It seems to me to be vital to examine colonial continuities and interconnections and to draw attention to them. Ceasing to see history and narratives as separate components of the past can be an effective tool with which to better identify and tackle discrimin discriminatory practices both today and in the future. Therefore, I thank all the participants and organizers of this important and ambitious and timely event. You helped us to work towards unlearning our privilege as our loss, to quote Gayatri Spivak, and thus not repeat the mistakes of the past. This process must uh, go on. Thank you for your attention. And now it's time for the reception. Uh, go to the stairway on the fourth floor, and we have informal speaking. Thank you.